Hello, travelers. Welcome to the Copper Fox Inn. My name is Thomas the Human Bard, and I am joined today by... Onog the Half-Orc Barbarian. And we are on another Unearthed Arcana Deep where we will be discussing the rogue class in the new one D&D Unearthed Arcana expert classes. I was I was wondering what we were going to talk about because Bean is over here being very silent and it looks like they have been replaced with a a, a, a plush doll version of themselves. Bean, Bean did the shadow jutsu where she replaced herself with a log and now <laughs> is somewhere else. Uh, and now the log is just sitting there doing the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Just Onog and I today, folks. Mercy and Bean are somewhere else off in the dungeon. I don't know. They probably like got caught up in no, a... No, Bean's right here. What are you talking gelatinous about? Gelatinous cube or something like that. Um, before we get the episode started, if you enjoy our content, please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel for future Unearthed Arcana homebrew discussion content. Um, comment below your thoughts on the Rogue, if you think this is a success or a failure on uh, updating the Rogue for one D&D, and how you would design the Rogue if you were the one in charge. And if you have a homebrew to send to us to talk about on the show, you can send it to us at our email, thecopperfoxin at gmail.com, or on social media at thecopperfoxin. With that out of the way, let's get started. The Rogue. Class Group Expert. Primary Ability, Dexterity. Rogues rely on cunning, stealth, and their foe's vulnerabilities to get the upper hand in any situation. They have a knack for finding the solution to just about any problem, demonstrating a versatility that is the cornerstone of any successful adventuring party. Rogues devote as much effort to mastering the use of a variety of skills as they do to perfecting their combat abilities, giving them broad capabilities that few other characters can match. Many rogues focus on stealth and deception, while others refine skills that help them in a dungeon environment, such as climbing, finding and disarming traps, and opening locks. When it comes to combat, rogues prioritize subtle strikes over brute strength. A rogue would rather make one precise strike than wear an opponent down with a barrage of blows. Why do many attack when small attack do When trick? one attack do good. Rogues have an almost supernatural knack for avoiding danger, and a few learn magical tricks to supplement their other abilities. Some but we rogues won't be talking about them. <laughs> we will not address them in this document, sir. <laughs> not appearing in this picture. <laughs> Some rogues began their careers as criminals, while others used their cunning to fight crime. Whatever a rogue's Press relation to, to the law, no comment. <laughs> maybe your uncle's the law, or maybe your dad's the law. <laughs> <laughs> no common criminal or officer of the law can match the subtle brilliance of the greatest rogues. All right, so that's the flavor of the rogue. Not, you I mean, know, it doesn't seem all that all that different than the kind of vibes they were going for before. Yeah, none of them so far have seemed to be a vast pivot in in flavor for any of the classes. I'm not expecting any to really surprise me and be like, actually, warlocks are completely differently flavored now. I think they'll all probably be about the same. I don't think that's part of what they're updating nearly as much as the actual balance and abilities. Creating a rogue. To create a rogue, consult the following lists, which provide hit points, proficiencies, and armor training. We'll skip through here a little bit. We've read this on the previous uh, yeah. classes, and it's all about the same. It's all about building your character, and it's very similar to what's already in the PHP anyways. Hit points, hit dice, 1d8 per rogue level. Hit points at first level, 8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points per level after the first, 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier. All seems pretty much the same. Proficiencies. Saving throws, dexterity, and intelligence. Skills. Acrobatics, investigation, sleight of hand, stealth, or... Choose four from acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. Okay. There's gotta be a better. 
there's gotta I mean, be a better way. <laughs> that's the way they described it. I, I mean, it's it's the I same as, as the rogue list before. So I am currently in black and white, wound up in a corded telephone cable, going. There's gotta be a better way. <laughs> as as I as I desperately open up my cupboards and all of the all of the plastic dishes come fly, flying out at me. Yeah, weapons, simple weapons, martial weapons that have the finesse property. So that means that instead, so they used to have simple weapons and short sword, rapiers, and long swords. So this fundamentally means that instead of long sword proficiency, they now have whip proficiency, unless the weapons get changed around or anything. Yeah, unless they've adjusted some of what the weapons mean, which we haven't seen much of yet, except for short swords now being a simple weapon. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. This is just. I would. I would just say. A pure, a pure uh, increase in functionality because while whips only do as much damage as a as a dagger, they do have reach, so that does give give rogues a little bit more like something to play with. Yeah, I think yeah, a little bit be... more variety in their dance, and also it gets rid of longsword proficiency, which while a holdover from older versions of D and D. Is stone cold useless on a fifth edition rogue? Yeah, <laughs> I think like it's being al- able to wield a longsword is never better than just wielding a rapier. I think it's also uh, useful that it, since it's a category now, any martial mm-hmm. weapons that have the finesse property, if they so ever if they ever add weapons add that have weapons, the finesse wa- property, yeah. that they automatically know how to use it. Yeah, they don't have to re-add it to this list. I think they've really started to learn that lesson to keep the game expandable going forward, being like, we'll make Mm -hmm. these things categories. And then that way later we can add a thing to the category and the category is what we check for, not the individual thing. Yeah. They had so many instances of like this, this, you know, this ability allows you to, you know, use charisma for, you know, uh, Short short bows, long bows, hand crossbows, heavy crossbows, and you know short crossbows, and which at the time were all of the ranged weapons that existed in D and D. And then they started expanding out for, uh, you know, with the gunner feet, with adding like uh, proficiency in in like flintlock pistols and and firearms. But because those were new ranged weapons. You know, the things that mention ranged weapons specifically don't mention those weapons anymore, you know, because they were new. They didn't include it and they didn't treat it as a category instead of just adding individual proficiencies to that scenario. Yeah. So overall, I think a a smart decision so that we can keep expanding going forward. Tool proficiency, thieves tools, armor training, light armor only. Starting equipment at first level. You start with the following equipment, or you can forgo it and spend 110 gold pieces on equipment of your choice. Okay, wait a minute. That seems like a different number than the numbers we have seen so far. Rangers start with 150. This is garbage. The the whole point. (laughs) And bards only start with 100 gold. Why? I thought the whole point was so that we'd all start with the same gold, so we wouldn't have that be. <sighs> well, nobody, nobody's background should give them something that gives them extra gold. But as we as we've seen in the player's handbook in the like starting equipment section, the different classes all have different amounts of starting money they can start with. Like for instance, monks and barbarians traditionally have the lowest amount of money because they're aesthetics and or homeless. Uh, well, and whereas, they, they like, need the fewest, whereas like and fighters, they need the fewest pieces fighters of and paladins need like heavier armor, which is more expensive. So they often start with more gold. Like, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But also like as a tight end with their class, it's more often, more likely that they just are a richer person, <laughs> apparently. That's, that's, according to the players that's input. so frustrating i thought the whole point was to balance it out i'm i over thought the it. whole point was to homogenize everything so that everyone has equal starting but i mean some people gotta get that where's my gotta get that chain mail where's my squirt ball bad jeremy <laughs> <laughs> bad jeremy <laughs> okay multi-classing and the rogue it seems to be just all the same regular multi-classing, multi-classing rules 
Rogue Class Features. As a rogue, you gain the following class features when you reach the specified levels in this class. These features are listed on the rogue table. First level, Expertise. You gain Expertise in two of your skill proficiencies of your choice. Sleight of Hand and Stealth are iconic choices for a rogue if you have proficiency in them. Yeah. Fair. But you can, you can do whatever you want, but here's what we suggest. But do whatever you want. You can be wrong. <laughs> Wizards of the Coast is allowed to be wrong. <laughs> First level, sneak attack. You know how to turn a subtle attack into a deadly one. Once on each of your turns when you take the attack action, you can deal extra damage to one creature you hit with an attack roll. If you if you are attacking with a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon, and if at least one of the following requirements is met. Advantage. You have advantage on the attack roll. Ally adjacent to target. At least one of your allies is within five feet of the target. Ooh, interesting. The ally isn't incapacitated and you don't have disadvantage on the attack roll. To determine the extra damage, roll a number of d6s equal to half your rogue level, round up, and add the dice together. The rogue table shows the number of sneak attack dice you get at each rogue level. The extra damage type is the same as the weapon's damage type. So this is, I think, the first instance of an actual pretty significant change so far. Did you catch the wording? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Did I? You tell Did. me, and then I'll tell you if I got <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is, the, there are two things that actually, I, I only caught the the second one upon this, this reading here. The first one, is the, and the primary difference in it is that it only allows you to gain sneak attack on your turn when you take the attack action. Yeah, I was before, I was wondering if that was a, a difference because I, I couldn't remember if that's how it was before. But after you and I off camera just talked about the attack action and when you can and can't take it and when it matters, that made me think, mm. wait a minute, does that mean I can't get it on my bonus action attack or my attack of opportunity? Mm hmm. Interesting. Um, but as as I think might be relevant here, bonus action attacks for like dual wielding aren't a thing anymore, uh, as as we might learn in the future True. in a future episode. But uh, the the bonus action attack um, for for dual wielding weapons has been conf con clumped all together in the attack action, where. It says if you are attacking with two light weapons, just add an extra attack when you take the attack action as part of that action. So, so that dual wielding mm -hmm. is still something rogues can do. It's just now, uh, I don't know if, I think I think it was uh, discussed in the long lost ranger episode we did a long time ago at the very beginning of the channel. Uh, where where I, I proposed, like, what if we got rid of the bonus action for dual wielding? Um, and just lumped it into you get an extra extra attack if you do a wield but um so that so this version of sneak attack still does work with dual wielding the problem is is it doesn't work with opportunity attacks or holding your action anymore so so if the rogue goes first which they are like to do as their primary <laughs> their primary uh, uh ability is dexterity and no, none of their allies are standing next to an opponent. What normally, what currently in fifth edition they can do is hold their action to when somebody gets next to an enemy, then they can attack that enemy and get their sneak attack with it. As these rules stand, you have to get sneak attack on your turn when you take the attack action. So there's no bonus. There's no trying to double up on sneak attack, which is something that rogues can currently do if they build. Yeah, if they if they build like a swashbuckler that likes weaving in and out of of combat and triggering uh, opportunity attacks to get their sneak attack, uh, that that entire play style doesn't exist anymore with with these rule changes. Interesting. So if you were if you were optimized building where it's like you're trying to get sneak attack as much as possible on your turn and then also as a reaction on someone else's turn. That damage has now been cut in half, basically. <laughs> um, so what was the, the second change? The second change, I believe, is ally adjacent to target. 
At least one of your allies is within five feet of the target. Now, this might be insignificant wording, but I believe the current wording of sneak attack doesn't say your ally. It says the target's enemy. <laughs> Which Interesting. Which are very often the same thing, but can also very often be not the same thing. Uh, you know, if you come across two warring, you know, factions and neither of them are your explicit friend, the original writing of the rules, you can get sneak attack if the person is distracted with their with their dire enemy. But with the new changes, unless that person is explicitly your ally, you cannot get sneak attack on them. Yeah, it says another enemy of the target. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So... All in all, this this also seems to be the thing that has gotten, I think, the the most ire in in this document for the rogue is everyone's like, y you just made sneak attack weaker for no reason. <laughs> yeah, we'll and, have to see how that plays out with yeah what they're going to end up trying to do with some of the subclasses, perhaps, especially stuff like the uh, assassin and things. If mm -hmm. maybe. They're, they're nerfing the base sneak attack to maybe make some of the subclasses have a better version of sneak attack, a more powerful mm -hmm. version. This also kind of, like, sings to me as, yeah, because this is, this is, we must remind everyone, this is still just playtest material. We can absolutely give feedback. And I believe when this goes up, there should, should be the, um, the, the survey. The survey, yeah. Yes, when, we will be the, linking this, the survey. When this episode goes up, you can go to D&D Beyond and take the survey and give your yes. feedback. We will be linking that down below in the description of the video. So if you are watching mm -hmm. and you want to give your feedback directly to Wizards of the Coast, you can scroll down there. And while you're down there, that subscribe button is just a few inches, a few pixels away. But but this, But a change like this seems to me a change that they're just changing for like a new version of D&D's sake. I think there's change a couple for of those. Sake, yeah. Yeah, just just changing because like it's a new version of D&D, &D, we have to change something. And I feel like we've been running into a bunch of those in in this yeah. particular document. I think part of it is just to see if that works better, see if people like it or to see if enough people get mad that we should change it back is basically what I think this particular section of the rogues <laughs> of the rogue class is is we change sneak attack. Does anyone notice? Does anyone care? Oh, everyone's mad? Okay, change it back. It's yeah, kind we, of like what we, they uh, did with uh, critical never, hits. We never meant for it to be that way. Yeah, no, actually, we were just yeah. going to see if you were mad about it. They, it they added the <laughs> critical hits can only happen on weapon attacks. Everyone got mad about it, and then they said, okay, yeah, we weren't... <laughs> when the second document came out, they they say, just use the old rules for critical hit. We're, we're not trying something else anymore. <laughs> Actually, we were just kidding. It was just a prank, bro, we swear. All right, first level ability, Thieves Can't. You picked up various languages in the communities where you applied your roguish talents. You know Thieves Can't, and one other language of your choice, which you choose Ooh. from the standard languages and rare languages tables. So it can be anything. So originally you just get Thieves Camp, but now you get another free language, which I think the, the flavoring of is good, of like mm -hmm. you not only can speak with other thieves in this coded secret language, but just you are due more to the about nature, the world. Yeah, yeah, due to your worldly roguish nature, you've picked up a little bit of something that helps you get by wherever you're from. If there's any other secondary language spoken where you live, mm -hmm. you needed to learn a bit of it in order to get in on the action or, or whatever, what have you. And if I remember correctly, this is this is part of the backgrounds changes from the last document that I don't think we ever really got into. But one of the things that they changed is there are rare languages and there are common languages, and you cannot start with a rare language as part of your background. Mm -hmm. You might be granted it uh, by a class. You or might be granted like it by a race or a class, like like we see here. But you cannot start knowing draconic and being a baker, <laughs> unless you are already a dragon person. You know, yeah, kind of a thing. 
which I think is fair. I've always felt like it's it like everyone in your level one party picks a different, like I speak celestial and I speak primordial. And it's like, it does kind of ruin like, the where, flavor. Where did you learn how to speak primordial? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> kind of takes the rarity out of those things to have, to have everyone be able to start with them. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the exotic and standard language delineation in the player's handbook had no meaning whatsoever because there wasn't any f- system set around it. Yeah. Second level, cunning action. Your quick thinking and agility allow you to move and act quickly. On your turn, you can take one of the following actions as a bonus action. Dash, disengage, or hide. <sighs> Two of them are underlined, which means I have to go to the rules which glossary. Means they've changed something. Okay, so let's start off with dash. Taking the dash action allows you to make a bonus move during the current turn. Move is also underlined, so let me go look up what the move does. <laughs> they're making us, they're, they're putting our, us through the paces. When you move, you can go a distance equal to your speed or less. For example, if you have a speed of 30 feet, you can go up to 30 feet when you move. Difficult terrain can slow you down. You can break up your move. You can move around other characters. Sometimes that creates difficult terrain. Climbing and swimming, you can use your speed to climb or swim. Some creatures have a climb or swim speed. If you use your speed to climb or swim, each foot would cost one extra foot. So similar to difficult terrain. Special speed, some creatures have special speed. Such as a climb speed, a flight speed, or a swim speed. If you have more than one speed, you must choose which one to use each time you make your move. For example, if you use one speed, you can use one speed. Oh, wait, it's a little longer. Now, let's see. You can use one speed. So that definitely seemed like a change for change's sake because they made it. I said the word speed so many times. They've made it so much more complicated that this is definitely going to get angry feedback. Yeah. I can see what they're trying to do because there currently is kind of a confusion where it's like if I have a 60 fly speed but only a 30 walking speed, can I walk 30 feet and then fly 30 feet? Or if if I've flown 45 feet and I land, I can't walk anymore, but I still have more fly speed left. So, you know, what does that mean? I feel like this is a more complicated attempt at an answer to those questions than is warranted by the question. One of the weird things is that it does make it so... Because uh, how Dash previously worked is that you gain extra movement equal to your speed. Equal to your movement speed, yeah. But how, but how this works is you get to, quote, move again. And each time you move is a unique mm-hmm. act, not action, but unique occurrence that isn't dependent upon the other one. And each one of them has to choose which one of your speeds you use when you start it. Mm-hmm. And so, and so if you're if you're swimming and you get to the edge of the river but you still have swim speed or movement speed left you you can't get out of the river cuz you swam you chose to swim so unless you use the dash action to climb or walk mm-hmm. let's say i have a 30 foot swim speed specifically mm-hmm. and i and i get like i don't know oh man I don't even know. I'm trying to think of like if my because originally if my original speed changes and then I take the dash action, I get an increase in my speed equal to whatever my current speed is, including Mm. modifiers to it. But Mm. now with each of these speeds as unique and separate from each other, only one able to be acted upon with any given moment. It's like if I if my swim speed is increased, but my walk speed isn't increased, <laughs> and I take the, yeah. the dash action. But do well, I, that uh... was that was already kind of a problem in a lot of things because if something says it increases your speed, the game implies it's only talking about your walking speed. So, for instance, yeah. haste. If, yeah. for instance, if you're an Aarakocra and you have a flying speed, I think the way that it has been ruled. It, in in the past has been like if you have haste on you it doesn't double your flying speed because it says it doubles your speed so it only doubles your walking speed which is why all the wording for all of the recent um abilities that have different mobility bill in like different mobility abilities like uh, additional climb speeds or like the fairies or owlkin people they have flight speeds 
they always say your flight speed is equal to your walking speed. So if you cast haste on them, it does double their flying speed because their flying speed is equal to their walking speed. And this is, once again, I think trying to resolve those issues which only existed because I feel like someone misinterpreted what the word speed means. <laughs> I'll be real. I hate most of this. And I don't have <laughs> I don't have the brain power to interrogate the shades of speed. Like this feels like this whole system just needs to be overworked. Like completely <laughs> overhauled because what what? <laughs> Why are you doing it like this? You're making it so complicated. Let me just yeah. go where I want to go. Stop but, making me do weird math. <laughs> but basically the long and the, uh, the the short of the long of it is dash or the the cunning action has been made stronger because they made movement inherently weaker. <laughs> yeah. Um and I think we still have the hide action as part of the cunning movement. And I can read that yes. one. Yeah, go for it. With the hide action, you try to conceal yourself. To do so, you must make a DC 15 dexterity check, stealth, while you are heavily obscured or behind three quarters cover or total cover. And you must be out of any visible enemy's line of sight. If you can see a creature, you can discern whether it can see you. On a successful check, you are hidden. Make note of your check's total, which becomes the DC for a creature to find you with a wisdom check perception. So hidden is also underlined. Hidden. While you are hidden, you experience the following effects. You experience Conceal. them deeply. <laughs> you, you feel it. You, you feel the concealment. You deeply. You aren't affected by any effect that requires its target to be seen. I'd Surprise. You aren't, yeah, you are hidden when you roll. If you are hidden when you roll initiative, you have advantage on the roll. Oh, that's pretty that's cool. This other I thing like where that. they seem to be drastically trying to change what surprise, surprise means works. in the game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's always been a, a bit of a hang up. Mm -hmm. Attacks affected. Attack rolls against you have disadvantage, and your attack rolls have advantage. So attack rolls can still be made against you, even though they can't see you. So there's always that. Uh -huh. Ending the condition, the condition that you experience of hidden, that is. The condition ends on you immediately after any of the following occurrences. You make a sound louder than a whisper. An enemy finds you. <laughs> you get the little exclamation point above their head. You make an attack roll. You cast a spell with a verbal component, or you aren't heavily obscured or behind any cover. So this this is a long-awaited clarification on what the heck hidden means. What does it mean to be <laughs> can, hid? Can I hide behind this barrel and then sneak to the other side of the combat zone? Well, not if anyone could see you doing it. You have you still have to maintain cover while hidden. Yeah, but once, cover, once you leave the cover, yeah. you are no longer hidden. And yeah, this is a lot of these are important clarifications on things they just forgot to put in the player's handbook or Xanathar's guide to everything because it's like they're just like yeah you're hidden and everyone's like yeah but what does that what does that mean How, can i hide behind this can i hide behind that like what what's hidden if i come out but then go back am i still hidden did i yeah. become unhidden but now i'm rehidden uh, yeah. The other drastic change this gives is a hard and fast DC check for a stealth check. Before, you just had to kind of, I guess it was implied, and once again, it was never really truly clarified, that making a stealth check implied that you had to beat the passive perception of an opponent trying to observe you. Mm -hmm. But now it is just you have to beat a 15. So... The, the enemy can, uh, can use a search action to actively use their perception to try and find you. But now I think, at least as these roles, rules currently exist, passive perception as a rule doesn't exist. Oof. We'll have to see. Which, They've I not mean, mentioned it is, it it is yet, one of those rules think. that the game doesn't really explain to you in, in the player's handbook. It, it is kind of used in all of the modules, like when the modules yep. 
recognize someone's going to try and sneak up at the party at this point. They say, if their passive perception is such and such. But yeah, the way this works now, that isn't technically how it works, at least for players. It might still work for enemies that way. It has... Passive perception for players might be valuable, but passive perception for enemies might be a thing of the past. It has always been one of those oddities that it's the only skill you're constantly making a passive check at, whereas mm -hmm. you're not like, you don't have like a passive arcana or whatever I think, like because i th i think part of that was like the I, I can't remember exactly when passive checks were introduced it might be three third edition i i genuinely don't remember but the reason they were introduced i believe was as a consolation prize to the dm because it used to be that the dm was the only one with the dice yeah, they yeah, were yeah. the ones rolling for your character and they just knew your character sheet or had it in front of them and so that's why, you know, DMs would often roll randomly is because they're having you make perception checks, but they don't want to alert you, the player, that something is sneaking around. Because what's, what's the quickest way to tell your players someone is hidden and around you? Ask them to make a perception check. Yeah. And so that's why passive perception and investigation and insight, things like that, became a thing so that the players could have a reasonable chance of discovering if someone was lying, but the DM didn't have to telegraph someone is li that they are lying, but you're just not smart enough to know what they're lying about. <laughs> Which, like you said, we haven't seen any hint of yet, so we'll have to see if that is is going to be brought through to one D&D &D or not. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. Third level, rogue subclass. You gain the thief subclass. That's the only one. They're not making any others. Get over it. No more thieves. I mean, uh, no more... No more uh, assassins. assassins. No more masterminds. No more arcane tricksters. You gain the thief subclass or another rogue subclass of your choice. The thief is detailed after the rogue class description, and other subclasses will appear in future unearthed arcana. Fourth level, feet. You gain the ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice. <laughs> That's a typo. It should say another foot of your choice. Fifth <laughs> level, uncanny what? dodge. When an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you round down. Sounds the same. I don't I can't think of any way in which it's mechanically different, but I feel like it's worded differently. Um, I think it's just mechanically the same. I think it I is. Don't, I don't think it's Let me I don't see. even think it's worded any different. I want to pull it up cuz I it's it, I feel like it's worded differently, but it might just be they retyped it for no reason. Let's see. Starting at 5th level when an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack. You can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you. Yep. See, this says an attack roll, not an attack. Well, that's because they're codifying what attack roll means and what attack means. Yes. Yeah, because so that's I think I believe slightly different. It is slightly different because technically, you know. A dragon's fire breath is a attack lowercase a. Uh huh. But, but not a it's roll. only a dragon's claw attack that is an attack uppercase a, or in this case, an attack roll. And so a lot of people were trying to use things like uncanny dodge instead of evasion at earlier levels to say, well, well, he's attacking me, so I'm going to take half the damage no matter what, you know. He made an attack, and, so, and it's hitting me. It's like, well, no, but it's not hitting you. But it is in not an the, attack. It is not yeah. an attack that has hit. It is yeah. flavor-wise. It's the, it's the flavor writing versus the mechanic writing, right? Of yeah. it, Technically, so is, it's an attack that has hit, but it's not a capital attack that has capital hit. <laughs> yeah, so this is a codification of something to make it so people can't weasel their way out of things that aren't how they work. Yeah, I mean, to I, I keep meaning to talk to you, travelers. Stop stop doing that. Stop weaseling your <laughs> way out of this stuff. You're being really unfair players, I gotta be honest. Accept your fate. All right, your turn. Sixth level, subclass feature. Seventh level, expertise. You gain expertise in two of your skill proficiencies of whoa, your choice. Whoa, whoa. Eighth level, foot. Ninth level, evasion. 
You can nimbly dodge out of the way of certain dangers when you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw. To take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw, and only half damage if you fail. You can't use this feature if you are incapacitated. So You originally get evasion at 7th level. So that's, that's what I was going to talk about. So you'll notice this is much later. This is 9th level. Because, That's weird. because you used to get expertise at sixth level, and evasion at seventh level, but because oh, is this Wizards of the Coast in this thing, they are trying to homogenize it's every subclass right? yep. on every class. That's what it add is. Add something at level three. Add something at level six. Add something at level ten. ten? You know, they're they're trying yep. to homogenize that so it pushes. So it pushed, because they don't want to give you a subclass feature and expertise, so they pushed it back, which pushes back evasion a level, but eighth level is when you get a foot. So they pushed evasion back even farther. Oof. So I think, I think honestly, pushing back evasion is a big problem, because that's, that's a very good feature and that's often that is a very iconic feature of the rogue um and pushing it back to ninth level that's like two levels before most campaigns end you know so uh -huh. when it was at seventh level you would at least have evasion for half the game you know kind of a thing now you're you're maybe getting it in the last third last quarter of a game you're playing with somebody yeah that's standard you know you know average average D, D, D game length that's pretty rough. I feel like they, I feel like they might want to give that another pass over and maybe combine some of the earlier ones to make it happen sooner mm -hmm. or something. Because like, I'm not that concerned if they get both a subclass feature and expertise of sixth level. It's not that big mm -hmm. of a deal to wait that one level for that. But it's a big I mean, deal to it, wait two levels for the evasion. Yeah, and it's not unheard of for them to give a feat at the same level as a subclass feature. I mean, in this document themselves, this itself, they are doing that at 10th level. I think part of the other thing is, is that if they don't shift this around, then ninth level rogues technically don't get anything. I mean, they get like 1d6 of sneak attack damage. But just and the make other up something thing, new. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. They might, they might want to think of something new, but until they think of something new, if they don't push evasion all the way back to ninth level, then rogues don't get something at ninth level, and they want to make sure everyone gets something at every, at every level. level. Which I'm all down for, but I do think yeah. that I'd much rather err on the side of like, oh, no, well, now there's this gap. Instead of stretching out what's already there, man, just throw Try me a and bone. Add something else. But I don't care if it's like a ribbon ability, just make it a flavorful thing to but picture what an aspect of rogue that might not be mechanically useful and just throw it in there just for fun, just for me as a favor. Mm -hmm. They hardly ever do that. And it's really getting pretty frustrating at this point. The <laughs> Jeremy never does me a favor. All right. 10th level. <sighs> Podiatry. 10th uh, level as well. Subclass feature. You get another feature for your subclass. 11th level reliable talent you have refined your talents until they approach perfection whenever you make an ability check that uses one of your skill or tool proficiencies you can treat a d20 roll of nine or lower as a 10 mm -hmm. sure so this this seems pretty standard for reliable talent the real question, and I believe the it's this very ability is what we brought up. Uh, I believe Bean brought it up when we were talking about the first uh, one D and D Unearthed Arcana, where they introduced the fact that a natural one is always a failure on a on a D twenty check. And so, does that apply to this? Because this ability says anything below a nine is treated as a ten, but the other rules say. If you roll a one, it always fails no matter what your number is. Let's see. So, Did they end up ad uh, addendumming the ability checks to do that? I think they might have said it doesn't do that anymore. Okay. They might have said that. I haven't 
necessarily read that in the context they, they, of yeah, this they, document. They've said uh, every document is probably going to come out with a rules glossary, and each of them will supersede previous ones for the document that they're in. And I think in this document, the natural ones, natural don't. 20s and natural ones are both uh, removed as the automatic fails or successes. So they just re- sort of return to normal. Okay, yeah. that's interesting to know. But that's part of why that first ruling was kind of vague is how does it interact with the way this one works yeah yep um I think yeah that's fair the 12th level you get additional foot 13th level subtle strikes when you attack you know how to exploit a target's distraction you have advantage on any attack roll that targets a creature that is within five feet of at least one of your allies who isn't incapacitated this this is an entirely wholesale new ability, I believe. And while you might think, hey, I get advantage on all my attacks forever, right? Is good. At 13th level, this is all but superfluous, I feel. There are so many different ways to get advantage. And even, like, obviously, if Tasha's doesn't get brought over, but Tasha's already had a way for rogues to get advantage on each of their attacks anyways is they could uh, there's the optional rule of taking like careful aim or something like that yeah Yeah. take aim and that sacrificed your movement for the turn and your bonus action but if all else fails it was an opportunity for you to get advantage on your attack rolls and this this basically the way that it functionally works out is just a slight improvement to how sneak attack works you can now just ignore the text that says if somebody's near it, because if somebody's near it, you have advantage. So a sneak attack works when you have advantage. Yeah. Huh. Do you think so? I, so at thirteenth level, I agree. I don't think this is all that exciting. Is this too good to roll it back to say have this at ninth level and we make evasion go back to seventh? Honestly, I don't I don't think so. Cuz once again, it's like I think this is just kind of underwhelming. We already have functionally what this ability does. You know, six ways you know, six ways the next week. You yeah. know, like you can get advantage if you need to figure if you need to get advantage, you can figure out a way to do it as a rogue. Heck, you can use a bonus action, hide, make that stealth check and then attack with advantage because you are hidden. That's six. That's what the rules say. So yeah. they already have built in ways and incentives to get advantage and just saying like, OK, now, you know, it's it's a it's like a, a, a pivot in design, just telling the rogue, OK, remember all those cool tricks you learned on how to get advantage so that you could become more powerful? Well, you don't need to do them anymore. So you just have advantage on attack rolls now if somebody's nearer. So you don't you don't need to hide. You don't need to take aim you just you just attack people now send so, a f- send a friend at them and you're good yeah so now suddenly you know your rogue has just become basically a barbarian at this point where it's just my job is to make the attack action i don't do really anything else <laughs> I, I always get advantage on it because I, I always have advantage on it as long as somebody's next to it and as long as i've got a weapon that i can make sneak attacks with I'm getting a sneak attack mm-hmm. once a turn. So so as we've seen in many instances, I think this is this is just this is an ability that from a design point you think would be a thing that the players would want, but actually <laughs> this is just a homogenizing and dumbing down of of what they are doing each turn. Man, I just had a really fun idea. Hear me out. Okay, this is a side tangent, folks. Go for it. Go we'll for get it, back to the rogue in just a second. Picture this, Onog, as some sort of a, a rogue subclass, like the gambler subclass or something like that, where mm-hmm. when you're attacking an enemy, each time you hit the enemy, like you can, or like each time you attack the enemy, you can choose if you want to have this one be when you expend your sneak attack on the attack. And if you choose to forego it, you now, the next time, you would choose to use it 
you have like an additional die on the sneak attack, right? So it like builds up over time. You're like hitting, okay. you're hitting them, you're but like building up for a jackpot. <laughs> but if you ever choose to use it and then miss, you lose all of the bonus ones you've gained. And you have to designate it before very the, much like yeah. a reckless attack before you make the attack. Uh-huh. You say beforehand whether you're cashing it in or not so that you can choose to be like, this is the one. And then you roll 30 dice because you're like, I've been saving these up for days. <laughs> that, that seems like a very fun homebrew. I don't know if that could function in a real game of D&D. I just love the idea of you being like, I'm spending it all, boys. I'm using my advantage Papa and my bardic inspiration, and I'm using this, and then you just happen I'm to roll like i using my DM inspiration. Uh-huh. You happen to roll like a natural one, and you're just like, but damn I'm it! A halfling. <laughs> <laughs> my 30 dice! now. I don't know. I do, I do kind of like a gambler rogue, rogue subclass that can just choose not to spend their their sneak, sneak attack, attack for a chance at a better sneak attack later so you get caught in that gambler mentality of like I could just go one more I get another die I could just go one more <laughs> All that's right. amazing 14th level subclass feature 15th level slippery mind now this is interesting because the, the fighter I did uh, I got a preview uh, from Jeremy of the fighter and it does have oh. at 15th level a uh, chonky mind. Um, so I'm <laughs> interested. I'm interested to see if the sorcery. wizard has a spicy mind or not. Yeah, we'll have to find out. And I guess the, <laughs> if the cleric has holy mind, pious, religious mind. I don't know. Nerd mind. Zealous mind. Your that cunning mind is exceptionally difficult to control. You gain proficiency in wisdom and charisma saving throws. Nice. Sure. So that means you are proficient in all of the brain, the brain saving throws. Well, not intelligent. intelligent. Well, but you start. With oh, you're already proficient in intelligence because of earlier. You are correct, yeah. Onog, and I missed that entirely. So now all so this of your is mental a, a stats. clear improvement because it used to just be you got wisdom saving throws, and now it's wisdom and charisma. Which does feel more like you've got a slippery mind because a lot of things that control your mind do take a charisma save. So. Do do charisma now. So true. I think as a, as a sort of olive branch for taking away the earlier <laughs> feature a functionalities. Sort of, a sort of olive garden for... <laughs> An olive garden of the slippery mind? Uh-huh. That's, that's got to be something. <laughs> I, am, I am outstretching this olive garden to you. <laughs> when you're here, your family. <laughs> your family. I'm a charitable guy. What can I say? 16th level feat. You gain the ability, score, improvement feat, or another feat of your choice. 17th level. Elusive. You are so evasive that attackers rarely gain the upper hand against you. No attack roll has advantage against you while you aren't incapacitated. I believe that's functionally the same, same thing. Uh, is 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 just like you're so cool no one can have advantage on you while you're awake no attack which is, has advantage against you while you aren't it's, it's exactly the same yeah which is important to note that it doesn't give people with attack rolls with that have advantage disadvantage it counters their advantage yeah it's, so it just they, says they cannot have advantage yeah so that means if someone's a, if someone were to be attacking you and they would have advantage, but something's imposing disadvantage. They technically can't have that advantage. So, does that yeah, does that so mean they're I, attacking I mean, they have disadvantage now? Yeah, they cannot have advantage. So there's no advantage to cancel out the disadvantage. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh for so, sure. They that's, do. That's that's my that's the stuff I love to do. I love <laughs> I love looking into that those slight wording changes. And I wonder. I, I I I clutch my my security blanket and stare out into the stars at night, and I wonder. In many of these instances, did they do it on purpose or did they just accidentally word it wrong? Did they accidentally <laughs> word it cool, but they meant for it to be less cool? Yeah. Yeah. If this but, is I mean, one if, it, level... if this has survived this, this iteration, maybe they always intended for it to be a thing that just stops advantage and doesn't stop disadvantage. Yeah. They do get it uh, one level earlier than traditionally because they yeah, bumped think, up the 20th level down to 18th. So yeah, this one they had, had to, to go shove somewhere the else. capstone around. Yeah. Why don't you read us that capstone, Onog? 
Stroke of luck. You have an uncanny knack for succeeding when you need to. If you fail a d20 test, you can turn the roll into a 20. Once you use this feature, you cannot use it again until you finish a short rest or a long rest. I believe that's the same as the level 20 uh, rogue capstone, which honestly <gasps> is a... Mu it's, it's very cool and flavorful as a 20th level. I think it's a much better 18th level capstone. There's one interesting element to this, Onog. Uh-oh. What did I miss? You've missed. It says D20 test. What, so, oh, so it's different than it used to be. It's are actually the, stronger. What are the three D20 tests? An attack roll, a skill check, or and a, saving, a throw. saving throw. It did not used to apply to saving throws. It used to be attack rolls, or, or if you miss an attack, you can turn it into a hit, or if you fail an ability check, you can make it a 20. So now it's any D20 test, you can, if you fail it, make it a 20. So you can automatically make something a crit that which, was going to be a miss. Which I guess, hmm, is that worse or better than saying the attack now hits? Because because a twenty, because uh, you're turning it I into mean, a if, twenty. If it, does it, it still it count the as roll a critical? A, if it changes the roll to a twenty, it's a critical, so it hits, right? Yeah, I believe that automatically means it is a critical. Oh boy, now that I might be something the... they need. We might need to give them feedback on and clarify. It's like, does it turn the whole roll into twenty, like numbers included? So if I had a plus seven to attack, does that mean I fundamentally rolled a thirteen, or do they mean the dice roll turns into a twenty, which is which can cause a critical hit? I am searching the document for the word critical. It only uh, appears three small times. Small footnotes at the bottom that say, please don't be critical of us. The rules for attack rolls and critical hits are found in the 2014 Player's Handbook. Whew. Okay, so that's regular. So it's just regular. Okay. So then that would mean a 20 is a critical. Okay. I guess. Once I again, so. does, does rolling a 20 mean it becomes a critical or does the dice says it is 20 also mean it could be a critical? I, I don't know. I have changed the roll to a 20, so I would argue the die has rolled a 20. I'm, I'm there with you. Ah, I approve. Well, I think the addition of the uh, saving throw is very good. Like, that's, it's minor, but it's nice that mm -hmm. you, if you ever fail a saving throw, which, you know, you're unlikely to because you've got all these saving throw uh, you're, proficiencies. You're, now, you're, you're now pretty very good smart at. in your brain. But you can also just be like, no, I didn't, which is almost like a miniature legendary resistance. A little bit, yeah. It, it, it they ha they have kind of gotten a, a little pseudo legendary resistance now that it's now that it works for enemy saving throws. Yeah, very interesting. All right, nineteenth uh, level feat and twentieth level epic boon. We've talked about this before on the other two. The tw the epic boon is a, a type of feat you can get at twentieth level. Replaces um, it used to be your capstone ability, but now every class's 20th level ability is just the epic boon ability. It gives you a suggested epic boon to take, but you can choose any epic boon from any listed epic boon if they ever make a full, you know, as list. long as you qualify for it, as long as you qualify for it. And if they add them to that list in expansions or whatever, theoretically, those new ones would also be um, possible for you to take. So the one here is the epic boon of undetectability. So let's see what that says. Epic boon of undetectability. Scroll down to the E for epic. Undetectability. Prerequisite, 20th level feet. Oh no, 20th level feet. Prerequisite expert group. So only experts can be undetectable. Repeatable, no. You can't be seen or heard by any means. And that's the end. <laughs> no. Magical or non-magical while you are hidden. So that, once again, kind of just raises more questions. So it's like you cannot be seen while you are hidden. So that does mean if you have taken the hide action as per the hidden rules, if you leave cover, you are no longer hidden so people can see you anyways. Yes. So this doesn't make you invisible. But it does mean that people's active perception checks cannot find you. You cannot be As found. long as you are still under the conditions of hidden. 
That doesn't seem very good for a level 20 feet. It also says cannot be heard by any means, which it said you break hidden if you speak louder than a whisper. So does that supersede this or does this supersede so that? Then, yeah, basically this gets rid of the you have to be quiet and people can find you by manually looking. Uh -huh. But every other aspect of hidden, if you take an attack and you miss... If it I'm hidden, technically cause the hidden thing to be fall, to, to the hidden condition to fail. If I so, am hidden, this isn't that useful. Onog, I have a question. If I am hidden and I have the epic boon of undetectability, and you uh -huh. cast scrying on me, what happens? I can, oh, I, I suppose. Wait, but it only works if you're hidden. So you have to actually actively be hiding from behind the behind cover, and then I can cast scry but you cannot be detected by the magical sensor if you are hiding but if you are not <laughs> hidden from where i put the sensor are you hiding anymore because if you don't have three quarters cover from the sensor are you hidden what? man this keeps me up at night folks uh. this is wild I can't tell if this is either much more simple than we're thinking or if they have not realized how complicated I think, this I is. I think they haven't realized how <laughs> complex this is. Either we're hi highly overthinking this or they have not written it correctly. Thomas, it's our job to overthink it. <laughs> yes, yes, it is our job to overthink. That is true. That is what homebrew discussions are all about. So that's your epic boon that they recommend, but... Per the usual, you can choose any of the other options in, instead if you wanted the epic boon of skill proficiency, become proficient in all skills, or the epic boon of energy resistance, gain resistance to um, a damage type, and you can change it at any short or long rest to a different damage type. Uh, That's fun. So if one campaign you're in a lava bubble, you know, in a lava tunnels, and then the next campaign you're, you're in a frosty mountain... This one switch them out. might perhaps be b even better than the epic boon of undetectability. The epic boon of the night spirit prerequisite mm -hmm. the expert or the mage group while in dim light or darkness, you can become invisible as an action. That seems slightly more useful than something that seems to not work with how the rules work. <laughs> you remain invisible until immediately after you take an action or a reaction. So you can just chill there, invisible in dim light. Although it does say you remain invisible. So wait, hmm. So if you, you leave can, the light, then do you become visible? So if, well, if the light changes, let's say someone lights a torch next to you after you already performed the action. I think you would stay invisible until... Because you at least started in yeah, dim light. Because it was you became invisible while in the dim light. And then you remain invisible until you take an action. So if you don't take an action, nothing else changing should make you uninvisible. You could you could you could accidentally succumb to your wounds or poisons and remain invisible forever because you couldn't take an action or a reaction. <laughs> if somebody immediately cast uh some sort of like paralysis spell on you so you can't take actions or reactions because you're incapacitated and then mm. you die. Are you invisible forever now? Is, is your corpse now <laughs> invisible? <laughs> uh, this is the this is the death the, the death mask monks all over again where they mm -hmm. can make each other invincible. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Life hack, folks. If you want to become invisible forever, die. <laughs> <laughs> Die while while using your epic boon. <laughs> Done. Easy. All right. Well, that's the epic boon. Um, like I've said previously, I like the ideas of ec epic boons more than I like mm. their specific choice of epic boons so far. I think the epic boons need a bit of reworking, but I am mm. a personal fan of choosing how you capstone your character. Um, that is very fun. Because it, it I can wish fit... Whatever you've got, if you've been the sneaky ninja character always in the darkness as a rogue, you can gain the one that makes you invisible in darkness. But if you're more of like the face of the group charlatan style persuasion and deception rogue, a different boon is probably going to do you much mm -hmm. better and will fit your flavor much more. So I, I like that you get that choice. I don't 
I don't really like because as as we've noticed, the epic boons also have like class and class group limit limitations. Like some of them are only for expert group characters or yeah. mage group characters. I I don't know how I feel about like the concept of an epic boon, uh, supposedly as they are introduced in the player's handbook or or dungeon master's guide as a gift from the gods, uh, only working on certain class types. Well, I definitely think this is a, a reflavoring of what epic boons are yeah, and how, how they fair. exist. Because this is, seems to be more like an epic boon of of experience as opposed to like a god came to you and said you're you're really good at this thing this is more right. like you've become so skilled at being who you are you are now epic in your qualities right but yeah. but it, it also at that point like i feel like these should just be suggestions because if i've reached level 20 with my barbarian maybe i also want him to be able to turn invisible in dim light but that's not a that's not available to him. You know, what if what if I'm what if I'm trying to build a predator build <laughs> you know, and I want to be able True. to just turn invisible? Well, what we could do, Onog, is your favorite thing. We could have the barbarian say, for epic boons, you count as being part of the expert group. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. So that course. now nothing matters anymore. <laughs> but yeah. I but I, I feel like limiting epic boons to class or only certain classes is just them trying to pigeonhole certain things in in ways that they don't need to be pigeonholed, I think. Yeah, fair. But that's just but that's just my opinion. Incorrect. It is it is absolute truth. The it subclass is fact and gospel. The subclass provided is the thief. You have honed your larcenous arts. Burglars, bandits, cut purses, and other criminals typically adopt this subclass. But so do rogues who prefer to think of themselves as treasure seekers, explorers, delvers, and investigators. In addition to improving your agility and stealthiness, you gain abilities useful for delving into ruins and getting maximum benefit from the magic items you find there. Oh boy, we're going to get into it, folks. Buckle up. Third level, fast hands. You have additional hands. <laughs> you have. You are three cream, no matter what. You have additional options for the bonus action of your cunning action, with which you can do the following. Search, take the search action. Sleight of hand, make a dexterity check, sleight of hand, to pick a lock or disarm a trap with thieves' tools or to pick a pocket. Hmm. The end. That's everything Fast Hands does. Onog, how do you feel about it? Well, kind of like, uh, I mean, it it introduces the concept of the search action, uh, which which is something that we can talk about later or now. I don't know. but uh, We can uh, get into it real quick. The search action is weird, but... Well, basically, from what I understand, later on in the feet or later on in the in the in the glossary, feet, they said. they they kind of imply that if you are using if you're doing something that requires a skill check at all, it should require an action. Yeah. So, for instance, searching through a box requires the search action. And it might be perception to see if you can notice something, or investigation to try and figure out how uh, this this particular hell cube from the from the torture dimension works. You know, something which like is that. which is sort of hinted at in original Five E with stuff like dragons being able to to make perception checks as like as as uh, uh, legendary legendary actions. actions, right? To make it, so it's like implied it would take an action to some degree, but it's never thoroughly like, yeah. It's never explicitly stated. But now, as we have asked, things like that have been explicitly stated. When you take the search uh, action, you make a wisdom check to discern something that isn't obvious. The search table suggests which skills are applicable when you take this action, depending on what you're trying to detect. Insight, if you're trying to detect a creature's state of mind. Medicine, to detect a creature's ailment. Perception, to detect concealed creatures or objects. And survival, to detect tracks or food. Detect food, please. I cast detect food with my mouth. 
I mean, yeah, it's just, I think they just broke, and there's probably an intelligence one somewhere, too, with, like, Investigate yeah, it's, and Arcana. Uh, it is. It is called, I think it's, like, Research or something like that. Mm. Let me see if I can find it. I, a study. The study action, which the is exactly action. the same, but for all of the intelligence skills. You know, if there's an area of knowledge that it would apply to, you can make that skill to do an action to get mm -hmm. a piece of information about that thing. The study. So action. it that does mean that you can only you can only do the search action. So you can only do the wisdom based stuff as your bonus action. You cannot investigate as a bonus action. You can only perceive as Correct. a bonus action. Uh, the other thing with sleight of hand, it's uh, it's my only issue with it is that it kind of goes back to the thing we talked about where if you codify something, then you don't have to make exceptions for it. So for instance, this gives the specific things that you can do as a bonus action using your sleight of hand features or sleight of hand skill, yeah. which I feel like should just be you can use sleight of hand as a bonus action and no matter what is being required of you in that moment you can do it as a bonus action yeah your like dm this, gets but, to decide if it's a sleight of hand check or not right like mm -hmm. but if 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 for instance it's a sleight of hand check that for some reason doesn't isn't involved in picking a lock or disarming a trap or or picking a pocket which there are several instances of that being the case in at least a couple of modules that i've read um, then it cannot use this bonus action the way that it's worded. It has to be doing these things, otherwise you cannot use your your cunning action to make it a bonus action. Yeah. It also noticeably lacks the use an object mm -hmm. part and of I think, fast hands. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's lacking. It's lacking use an object, which because of um sage advice granted by by uh Jeremy Crawford cuz people have asked so does fast hands you know it says use an object does that you know that means any action any object that could have an action use you can now use it as a bonus action and then Jeremy Crawford said yes except for magic items you know the most prevalent kind of item in the game because that would be the magic item activation action mm -hmm. which is different than use object so when people realize that use object means almost exclusively throw caltrops or like cuz caltrops are not a, a magical item yeah or light candle, which you could already sort of do not as a real action. Yeah. And so it they they've probably taken it out because through through errata they have made it meaningless. But that's the sort of question at the end of the day. Is this anything? If I look at this and go fast hands, third level, I can take the search action as a bonus action and I can uh, well, pick a lock as a bonus action. It will this ever come up? Is this anything for me? Well, see, see, that's the thing, and that's kind of the problem with the way we're being doled out these this test material, is we can't really test this subclass in a vacuum. Yeah. We cannot test the thief unless we can test the arcane trickster and the assassin alongside it to see what their changes are, because my current my my like with the way the thief currently works, I. I ask the question, why would I be a thief if I can be an arcane trickster? Because the arcane trickster gets all of these same benefits, except they can cast Mage Hand and use it to pick pockets and pick locks as a bonus action. So at, level, at third level, arcane tricksters are just better at being thieves than thieves are. Mm -hmm. But unless that ability has been removed from arcane tricksters, I can't tell if this ability is meaningful or not. Because it's, it's uh, yeah. the, the only way we can tell if they're meaningful is if they are compared to each other in a certain degree. The other third level ability you get, because you get two of them at third level here, is mm -hmm. second story work. You've trained to reach especially hard to reach places, granting you these benefits, a climb speed, you gain a climb speed equal to your speed, and jump distance. When you take the jump action, you can make a dexterity check instead of a strength check. Because now jumps are checks instead of being a flat number. Mm -hmm. 
thing. You do a check have, about it. Have we talked about that before? I don't know if we have the time. <laughs> it's a whole <laughs> so problem. <laughs> you can no longer jump as part of your move. You take the jump action, which, as all actions are, is an action to, to do. Yes. So you, unless you have abilities that allow you to take multiple actions, you can only jump once per turn. And once again, like taking the hide action, it has a hard and fast set DC, which means that if you are jumping farther than you should be able to, you make this check, but the check that you make adds... Uh, let's just read it. <laughs> okay, let's read it. I'm sorry. We can, we can cut this if you want. But. Let's see here. Go ahead and jump. Jump! With the jump action, you attempt to leap more than five feet. A jump of five feet or less is treated as difficult terrain. When you take this action, your speed must be greater than zero, and you must make a DC 10 strength check, acrobatics or athletics. If you don't move at least 10 feet immediately before this action, you have disadvantage. On a failed check, you leap five feet, horizontally or vertically. Can I decide when when I fail, whether I'm going horizontally or vertically? Because if I wouldn't I would like cross the gap, up. if I if I can't cross the gap with a five foot leap, I just I jump five feet straight up and then land back down. <laughs> oh, I would I would actually rule that as like you getting cold feet. Yeah, you know, it's like you you get a running start and you go to make the jump <laughs> and you know you can't do it, so you just hop straight up out of fear. <laughs> <laughs> On a successful check, the checks total determines the distance in feet that you can clear horizontally or half that total if you're jumping vertically round down this jump doesn't expend your movement but the distance you clear can't exceed your speed so this this fundamentally puts the jump uh, the ability to jump as a pseudo dash action because it doesn't take up your movement but it, you do have to use an action to jump, so you might as well dash, kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so, or it, it, is, it might as well be a dash. Um, this is an interesting instance, I think, of the way that they've worded this, where you can pass a check and then still fail the thing you were trying to do. Yeah, because you could pass, and then you roll, okay, a 12, and they're like, well, it's a 14-foot gap. And you're like, well... Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> and so, so for instance, I don't know, say Bardic Inspiration that only triggers when you quote unquote fail a check. Bardic Inspiration can't help you jump that gap anymore. Because you Whereas technically it could succeeded help. the check. Because you succeeded the check, but you Man. are still falling to your death anyways. What if it was just a check whose DC is equal to the amount of feet you're trying to jump? I mean, that would be basically what rolling the dice would be for. <laughs> but that's but that would change whether or not the success or the mm -hmm. or the fail. Oh yeah, happens. it would it would certainly change the wording of success or failure exactly. and allow different abilities to actually work with it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but but it is it is interesting as it stands. So so currently in this document, as we've discussed with the move ability, and now that we've discussed with the jump ability, they want. It was already kind of clunky what you could do on your turn as far as jumping and moving was considered. And now they've wanted, they've kind of gone out of their way to make everything even clunkier, but more well-defined clunk. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's the, the, this, this garbage is in HD now. <laughs> hey, yo, this garbage in 4K. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it. I think this is an interesting idea on how to handle movement and jumping i i don't know if it's better than what we had before and it might be one of those change for changes sake i've had to think about how speed works more while reading this document than i have than you've had the entire time you've ever played D &D. In, in the entirety of my DD career and i hate it i hate every second of it and i think that's mm -hmm. the feedback is that wizards um I don't want to have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Don't make me worry about it. <laughs> Take as much of that away from me as possible and just let me know, can I make the jump or not? Just tell me, man. Just tell me. If I can make it, I can make it. If I can't, I can't. Don't make this speed stuff so complicated. Oh, boy. 
All right. But so the the thief the thief can use his dexterity instead of his strength. But it can still be a dexterity athletics check, right? I believe it is. Or a dexterity acrobatics, but you can swap out this the strength for dexterity. Yeah. Because it used to be strength. Yeah, it was strength acrobatics or athletics. So you can you can be a strength acrobat now with how the rules kind of work. Or and, a dexterity but, with, but the thief can be a dexterity athletic. Interesting. I do. Man, I don't like any of this. I love D&D and rules and finding finicky ways they interact. I hate this. This is torture mm-hmm. for me. This, <laughs> travelers, I'm having a bad time. You can just see yeah. my eyes are just getting darker and darker as I sink lower into my despair. Uh, my jump is the dex and then my speed, but I dashed, so my, but I can't but it, climb but you didn't if dash, I... You can just uh, only jump as far as uh, your speed is. So you can't jump terrible. more than 30 feet. Okay, so here's my big problem immediately. So third level, fast hands, third level, second story work. I have a climb speed, and that's so far the only thing I'm even a little bit compelled by, flavor mm. and action-wise, for my thief-flavored rogue. The rest of it feels superfluous and irrelevant. <laughs> Give me something in more interesting here. Fast hands, have it be that I just always have advantage to pickpockets or something. Or or second mm-hmm. story work, say that I gain a climb speed and also I take less fall damage or something. Like make these Did someone say always have advantage? Because that's what our next ability is about. <laughs> well yes, of course. But I'm just saying like make these things more compelling. Mm-hmm. Give me I think I think bonus action sleight of hand is is nice because you can you can be that, you know, Oliver Twist esque character just like moving through a c- crowd and just picking picking pockets left and right and people can't really see but in can't my, really pick up on you. In my mind, bonus action only really matters during initiative. Mm-hmm. So when during initiative I'm fighting a when horde did, of ten During goblins, initiative, do you need to pick someone's pocket? Am I picking? I can, and I get that. I totally can. But when would it matter that I can do it as a bonus action versus like as a, an action? Yeah, it's a very niche scenario yeah. of like, oh no, the wizard has the amulet. Uh, yeah, that we and that's need to totally get off valid. But it's like I could just use my action for it then. In what situation am I going to be so out of resources? I need to make sure I have my. Bonus action to pick a pocket during combat. Like, I don't know, man. That's a a very decent point. So it's like, why not just say, like, I'm better at picking pockets just all the time in some Mm. more meaningful way? (laughs) That's that's, that's a fair (laughs) response. All right, give me the next one, Onog. You have chosen chosen the rogue with the thief subclass. You have advantage on all checks. (laughs) Just, you're better. All right, speaking of advantage on all checks... Supreme Sneak. You have advantage on every dexterity check, stealth, you make, provided you aren't wearing medium or heavy armor. So this is a drastic rewording of how this ability worked before. Yeah, it used to just be advantage on stealth dexterity checks or dexterity stealth checks if you move no more than half your speed on the same So it's just like if you take it a little slower, you're better at it. Now this is dictating the kind of thief you can be. Because before you could multi-class into whatever and as long as, as long as you only move half your movement, you get advantage on stealth checks. Now it doesn't or... care how much you move. You can't wear heavy armor or medium armor. Or, unless you take your armor off and you reveal your, like, wetsuit underneath. (laughs) You you spend an entire minute taking your armor off, which is all of the combat. (laughs) Well, I'm saying not during combat, right? You make your stealth checks to, like, sneak around the embassy or whatever. And you're like, well, I am a... You're James Bond in a... I'm a a four levels of paladin and six levels of rogue, tenth level character. But in order to sneak around, I'll just take my heavy armor off for my sneaking mission, and then I'll put it back on. Ew, he naked. He naked. You could technically do that. Don't ask me. I mean, me. yes, but <laughs> no one likes the words take see, off your armor in D&D. It is not so true. Not I, well received. See, I like that this Supreme Sneak 
assumes you'll be sneaking during things like, I don't know, outside of combat. Whereas the original mm-hmm. one is written only for, it says, half your speed on the same turn, i.e. combat turn, right? Mm-hmm. Which because led if to you're people just doing saying it narratively, that just means you always have advantage on sneak attack. Yeah, which led, but that also led to people saying, well, if it's not like, how do I determine if it's my turn and if I'm using half my movement if I'm not in initiative? And people would get weird about that stuff. Now this mm-hmm. just says, hey, as long as you're just not wearing heavy or medium armor, you just all you just always have it. Don't worry about it. And I like that. I think that's smoother. I think I do, it, I do it gives like the same benefits the more or less. It. Like it's, yeah, it's clean. It feels clean, no, no. And I get that it is pigeonholing you a little bit into, well, I know you like medium armor, but sorry, you, you can't wear it to get this benefit. But honestly, it's about that finessing you into the specific thief archetype. And it's and like want you to be in, yeah. the higher the level of the subclass ability, the more it's going to expect you to be kind of hitting a niche. And like, that's, I think, totally fair. My highest level thief ability should require me to kind of be acting like a thief to get to get a benefit what? from it in some way. No. Right. And so sixth level, I should at least be committing to like, OK, well, I won't be a heavily armored combat character or I'll at least have armor I can take off when I need to. Yeah, I like it. So far, the first I'm in, first one I'm impressed with. Let's see if I like uh, the next one. I don't think I do, but tenth okay, level. Here we go. <laughs> use magic device in your treasure hunting. You have learned how to maximize use of magic items, granting you the following benefits: attunement. You can attune to up to four magic items at once. I like that. Nice. I like that. A precedent previously set by the artificer. That's sweet. It, this couldn't possibly go wrong after that, right? Charges. Mm. Whenever you use a magic item property that expends charges, roll a d6. On a roll of six, you use the property without expending the charges. Cool. Okay. All Not right. Bad. Okay. Very much more situational, but not bad, especially yeah. cuz there are there are a fair number of incredibly powerful magic items that have charges that don't recover. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know, a, a luck blade with wish charges? <laughs> hmm You could just get free wishes off of this? Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to roll a six, but hey. Yeah. You you have a you have a 33% chance. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's a 60... Or what is Half it? What of is 33, it? so... It's one out of six. It's a one sixth chance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you get you have a one sixth chance of just yes. getting a free wish. Yeah, I mean not every bad. Every time you wish. Not bad. And then scrolls. You can use any spell scroll that bears a cantrip or a first level spell. You can okay. also try to use any spell scroll that contains a higher level spell, but you must first succeed on an intelligence check arcana with a DC equal to 10 plus the spell's level. On a successful check, you cast the spell from the scroll, and you use intelligence as your spell casting ability for this casting. On a failed check, the scroll disintegrates. Mm, that seems like one of those abilities that causes you to pivot the way that you've built your character halfway through their their level ups it also sounds like i don't know why isn't that just how spell scrolls work already <laughs> because then they couldn't give it to the thief as a special ability so oh they... go- oh you were so <laughs> right onog oh you're so correct See, i i i had a i had a horrible day when i realized you have to be able to use magic to use spell scrolls yeah because the rules in the there are two different sets of rules in the book in in the dungeon master's guide and the player's handbook and they each talk about scrolls and one of them says as long as you can read the scroll you can use it and then the other set of rules say only you can only cast spells from a spell scroll if you could that already cast spell that spell would appear yeah. on your class spell list yeah. And you might be wondering, why on earth would they have the first set of rules only to be immediately contradicted by the second set of rules? Because secretly, there are a, there's a second set, there's a second kind of scroll. Second kind of magic scroll that aren't spell scrolls. They are just 
scrolls that that uh, hold on, I have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> they they are scrolls that don't let you cast a spell, but they are magic items that are scrolls. And I this see. is the delineation between those two. But you don't the the one rule set makes you make implies that you should be able if you can read the language the scroll is in you can use it. So therefore, if I can read the spell scroll that cat that says cure wounds on it and it's in common, I can use the spell scroll. But the second set of rules does not mean that, that I have to have it on my spell list already b- before I could use it. So so oh no. If I was to ask you, just sort of off the top of your head, what mm-hmm. would you say the most iconic aspect of the thief in original 5th edition was? Well, originally what this ability was replacing was you could attune to any magical item yeah. regardless yeah. of its limitation. So very uh-huh. much like very much like <laughs> the ranger can just take fighting styles even though he's not a warrior the thief rogue could attune to i don't i don't know you know uh, staff of the woodlands even though he they're not a druid yeah or or the instruments of the bards even though they're not a bard you know kind of a thing yeah i think that was the kind of originally when everyone thought of what a thief rogue does they thought well they kind of steal the magic items and they can always use them yeah. They, they're always you, looking for you treasure. You are incentivized to steal because you can always uh-huh. use. Uh, you just can't. You just don't have that anymore. You just don't have that anymore. Yeah. So you, they took but, away but like you the can cool maybe one thing. Cast a spell. Scroll. Maybe you can maybe cast a find trap scroll that you get, <laughs> and it might do the same don't thing if it fails me. as if it succeeded. Don't tempt me with a good time. Uh, but yeah, you just can't do that anymore. It's um, now. It's nothing. It's nothing. So, so far on this class, we have, you can attune an extra magic item. Cool. Sometimes you don't use up a charge on a magic item. Cool. Neat. And you have advantage on stealth checks while not wearing armor. All right. So that sounds and like. And you can climb. Uh, and you can climb. Uh, okay, sure. You can climb. But so Which far. Which might not be very useful if you so learn far, how to fly. So far, I have a question, Onog. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just sounds like a kind of a wizard. Why is I this mean, the flavor the, the, they're giving with a thief? This doesn't make me feel like I'm stealing things. This makes it me makes feel, feel like I'm a wizard. It makes you feel like you should have been an arcane trickster, like I said at the beginning. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, now you can't wear armor, and you get more magic items, and you don't use up your slots. Yeah, great, for my wizard character. Why would mm-hmm. any of that matter for my character that's like, oh, me old chums, I'm just, uh, I'm fresh off the streets of London where I've been pickpocketing the, the lords and ladies. None of that is anything to that character. What is this? Why is this all here? This feels like someone designed this for a completely different... Ah, It bothers me so Mm -hmm. much. Yeah. If if you sat me in an empty room... In the beginning, they they are that little, that, you know, that little Oliver Twist character. But then it mutates them, not even with, like, the the rigors of a campaign that always changes your character you know yeah. it's just in its class abilities they are no longer who that character was they are now a different person even though that's not how classes are supposed to work yeah no i don't it, uh, if you had me in an empty room for a hundred years with nothing but a typewriter and said type out all possible permutations of what you think a thief mm-hmm. in an rpg should do you would I, starve to death i would week. never design this <laughs> oh that, never. That too. <laughs> I would never come up with these. They all feel like they're that one ability. Like each of these abilities feels like they are each individually that one ability someone excuses by going, oh, it's like from a previous edition or something. Mm-hmm. But they all feel like that. <laughs> every yeah, one these of are, them. These are all, <laughs> we are playing telephone with people who were making, <sighs> making D&D 30 years ago. <laughs> it's wild. Okay, hit me with the, the, the capstone here so we can at least finish it off and go home. All right. Thief's reflexes. You can now make a take a second bonus action on your turn. Ooh. Provided it is the bonus action from cunning action. 
You can use this feature on a number of turns equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. I can already tell you that's not better than what was <laughs> what the ability was before. It's not. It should have ended after it said counting action. I don't care. That's that's a great thing. It's just like you just have more. You, you just have just, a second. You just have more bonus actions. Cool. Why do I you need can that? always cunning action twice at least? Yeah, I can always hide and then attack and then hide again. Cool. That's 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 amazing for a really high level thief. Or, or they can even pick someone's pocket and then if they get caught, hide again. And then you know they have so much action economy in the things that they are good at and in that very limited scope they could of what pick, their cunning action can do. They could pick three locks on their turn. <laughs> they, they could pick... <laughs> the, it's, it's like those those chess aficionados who are like uh -huh. playing 15 different games they with could, a room of people. <laughs> they could action, pick a lock, first bonus action, cunning action, sleight of hand, pick a lock, second bonus action, cunning action, sleight of hand, pick a lock, three locks, one turn, Onog. This is crazy. This is unprecedented. Amazing. Amazing. Now, do you want to know what Thief's Reflexes was before? Oh, I know what it was, but I've played a high level thief before, <laughs> but you tell the, the travelers in case I they're will, I will tell the travelers. When you reach 17th level, you have become adept at laying ambushes and quickly escaping dangers. You can take two turns during the first round of any combat. You take your first turn at your normal initiative and your second turn at, a, at your initiative minus 10. You can't use this feature when you are surprised. Fair. So they, this thief can unlock four locks on their first turn of combat. <laughs> they can literally unlock more locks. We've lost one lock. We've lost one lock. Damn. Uh, this is a real train wreck of a subclass. I have to mm -hmm. be honest. I understand the people at Wizards of the Coast. They're doing their best. But we are here to provide the feedback, folks. And the feedback is, name one, Not part, this. <laughs> name one part of this that makes me feel like I'm a thief. Name, name one. Name one. You can search as a bonus action. <gasps> oh my! You're right. I'm the best thief who's ever lived. I'm the. I'm the. <laughs> I'm a well, I mean, cat in those, in those high octane situations where it's like you need to find the magical key to the door in the room that's filling. Yeah, with the magical key that I fire can't gas. use because it's, it requires a wizard's attunement. Cool. Oh, I'm so yeah. mad, Onog. I'm so mad. But I'm, yeah, this I, this ugh. this is. <laughs> this is what we like to call uh, in the business uh, a step back. <laughs> There's smoke coming out my ears, folks. Like I was, I was already of the opinion that it's like the thief, while interesting, is not that good of a rogue subclass. And then they went and just made it it's, strictly worse. <laughs> it feels like they were like, whoa, 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 the thief's way too good. We gotta bring it down. But it was already not one of the best subclasses. It mm -hmm. was fine if you were willing to rely on its flavor more than its mechanical mm -hmm. like usability. But even then, and like, if and if you're building for flavor, that's perfectly fine. That that's is, perfectly that, that fine. is fine. But this isn't good at that either now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now it's got neither of the things. <laughs> Ugh. I want to do a rework of this thief class to make it good. Cause man, I'm disappointed. It feels like they're scared. It feels like they are literally at every action going, Oh, it can't be too good. Well, and, and here's also the situation it's where it's not that good anyway. It's fine. Let we them have don't it. understand why wizards of the coast has made these changes. Yeah. We only understand that they have, that they are theoretically, anticipating to make these changes so we don't know if they're like no all of the subclasses are too strong we need to bring them all down to this level or or if it's just or if it's just another instance of them changing stuff and seeing if we even notice and if nobody cares then they can keep it or maybe change it to something different you know see they, i didn't feel this way about either the bard or the ranger i felt both of those were okay the ranger a little underwhelming mm -hmm. but fine right like it was a little not great but, but there but were some, some cool mechanical stuff. benefits and like for it being in the expert class you know yeah and it made me t to its goals feel like a hunter most of the way like mm -hmm. like except for there the final ability the rest of it made me feel like a hunter just fine not a single one of these makes me feel like a thief really like it's just it feels like so at odds with itself like it's trying to do 20 things none of them being being a thief mm -hmm. 
And as we've we've seen historically in fifth edition, if you're trying to do two things at once in your subclass, then you don't do any of them very good. Yeah. Here's a good thief fast hands for you. You gain you, you gain access to a, a bag of holding style pocket dimension that is like five <laughs> five feet by five feet, but it <laughs> is it is always up one of your sleeves. <laughs> you just all you have a have a pre sewn in uh, bag of holding. That's fun. Uh huh. Like if you yeah, pu- if you I- put an object up your sleeve, it goes away into your pocket dimension. That that is very fun because you steal it because you're a thief. Do you it's get just, it? Swoop. But but once again, like, kind of what I said before, especially with the, you can use spell scrolls now. Mm-hmm. This thief is just a fundamentally worse version of an arcane trickster. Yeah. Because arcane tricksters get all of the fast hand stuff they can do, but they... But with the requirement that they're using their mage hand to do it, but that means it's better because their mage hand is invisible and they can they can do it at range. So even if they're caught pickpocketing, they weren't caught pickpocketing because an invisible hand was the thing doing it and they were 30 feet away. And mm-hmm. then they also can use spell scrolls because they can cast spells normally so they don't have any of the limitations that the, that the thief had of... No, but you, you you can use a first level spell scroll, but if you try to use higher level spell scrolls, there's a chance it'll fail. Because arcane tricksters just have scaling spell casting. So if they're planning on getting rid of the arcane trickster, then maybe this thief might have something to grant us. But as 5th edition currently stands, I don't feel like we should be moving on to a new edition of D&D if we're not getting something for it. If all we're getting are kind sure. of watered down versions of already existing classes and subclasses, then let, we're just going to keep playing fifth edition. This isn't this isn't something that will draw someone to sixth edition or five point five. It doesn't have that razzle dazzle. Yeah, it doesn't have that razzle dazzle. Like if if you just made a subclass that is just a strictly worse version of a different subclass that already exists, that's not engaging. That's not interesting. No one cares about that. For sure. Yeah, oh, man, so much of this, if the, it, it just feels like I said, like they're scared of it. Like so much of this could just mm-hmm. be a better ability. And you'd think, well, you can't make all the abilities just better. It'll be too good. It still wouldn't be that good. <laughs> like even if they were all a better version of the ability, it still wouldn't mm-hmm. be that great. I saw somebody commenting about the Hunter Ranger is... Like it's passable, right? It's pretty decent. Mm-hmm. It's not overpowered. I mean, it's it's basically basically a, a homogenized version of the current Hunter Ranger. Uh-huh. You could make that Hunter Ranger with the current rules. But it's by no means too strong, and arguably a little weaker than what we currently have because it loses some of its versatility of what letting mm-hmm. you pick what you get. Somebody did quote Jeremy Crawford in saying he was like concerned on whether or not they'd gone too big on the hunter ranger and made it too good too good i mean uh-huh. that's, that's so that makes ex- me worried. that must almost exclusively be referencing first level hunter's mark that's the <sighs> that's the only thing i could be thinking he's talking about because nothing else is even fundamentally different with the exception it's, of expertise in multiple skills. It's not, it's, that's the thing, is he was like, uh, we probably went a little overboard on the ranger, but we'll really, it's still not that good, Jeremy. I think you are vastly overestimating what going overboard means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it, it feels well, I, like I they're like so in scared. The base, ranger, the base ranger just is strictly better than the current ranger. And I'm focusing on the subclass where it's just strictly worse. (laughs) Well, but even that is like the current ranger isn't like one of the best classes already. So making it Mm -hmm. a little bit strictly better isn't like we went overboard. It's like we did the bare minimum to bring it up to usability. I think Mm -hmm. it's like it's the thing. It feels. And or just making all of the abilities feel like they're useful. Yeah, exactly. Inusable. It feels like. And I guess this is kind of my my now overall thoughts on all three of these classes and what we've seen of one D and D so far. What I was hoping was a brave step forward into new, interesting, and flashy 
design choices to add some zip and some sparkle to D and D fifth edition. And what I'm feeling is that they're terrified to make anything too good. What they deem as quote too good. When mm. I was looking for let's amp D and D fifth edition up to be even bigger and better than it was. They're trying to file it down to make sure nothing is too good. Mm-hmm. Cause like we do. And, and that's the thing is like, this is only a problem in like power gaming builds and concepts and things like that. But we do have scenarios in current fifth edition D and D where something is strictly the best option. If you want to do X, you do Y. That's that's just how games work. Yeah. Uh, that's that's how it all gets boiled down. That's why speed running, <laughs> the speed running community in video games is a thing. Because people will always find the thing that is the fastest, the best, the most efficient the th- to get to the goal of what they want to do. Fastest. And so job. they're trying to curb human nature by making everything bland (laughs) on top of each other yeah it's a classic i mean you see it a lot in like video game development and i guess game development sort of in general but this it this this process towards perfect equity amongst all options that instead of feeling like uh freedom feels like hamstringing Mm mm-hmm it's the same complaint I had when they were like, okay, instead of choosing individual pets for, for things that summon pets or you know, familiars, you now just have this base animal and then you can reflavor by giving it slightly different abilities. That doesn't feel like getting a, a freedom to choose. That feels like having my options being removed because you couldn't come up with something better. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's a big conversation about game balance and how to properly make something like D&D quote unquote balanced, Uh, because like Mm -hmm. with that type of balance, there's much more going on than simple mathematic balance. Real balance in game design for TTRPGs is about balancing the fun of all of Mm -hmm. the participants in the game so that everyone feels like they are they are contributing. They are put participating they are able to um Mm -hmm. act in game in such a way that they feel fulfilled by it and some people will get that from doing the most you know mathematically useful things and other Mm -hmm. people have much more uh fluffy desires like in in role play and flavor Mm -hmm. and those things are what need to all sort of be balanced against each other to make sure that there's options to balance out everyone's ability to have fun Mm -hmm. not necessarily just a strict white box scenario mathematically balance out everything in the player's handbook because that won't make it so that everyone's having the right amount of fun it's it's targeting a very specific type of fun and demographic of what people Mm -hmm. are looking for in the game because like what i'm talking about with this thief subclass it's all about it doesn't fulfill the thief fantasy for me no amount of mechanical boosting of just dice or numbers of these abilities will make them make me feel more like mm-hmm. a, a thief. And that is what needs to be balanced out. The things that interface with the player experience, not just, well, it was too good at third level, so we moved it around. That's That has a balancing place. Like, that does need to be mm-hmm. thought of to make sure... There, and there, there are discussions to be had for that. Of but... course. But all of these things need to be, quote unquote, balanced in the way that everyone's got a means of having fun at the table. (sighs) We got a little off topic there, but that will. uh, It seems Thomas and I cannot have a have a have a guy's night without complaining about the ranger at some point, (laughs) no matter what the topic. is. Look, it's what I like to call off topic, but on brand. (laughs) Yes. Thank you for listening, travelers. If you've listened all the way to the end of this episode, thank you so much. Remember to hit that like button if you enjoyed the episode and hit the dislike button if you didn't enjoy it. If you want us to, you know, do something better next time, make sure if you do hit that dislike button to just comment down below what you think we can improve on. We're always trying to make the show better, more entertaining, um, more educational for you travelers out there looking to get into D&D homebrew. 
If you have homebrew you'd like to send to us, you can send it to us at our email, thecopperfoxin at gmail.com, or on social media, at thecopperfoxin. And that will wrap it up for today. We have to go off and find Bean and Mercy, wherever they got to. Eat- well, the, the Bean the bean Jiu-Jitsu doll just started glowing and floating down this hallway, so maybe we can check that way. We can follow that. Yeah, that sounds like a good lead to start on. But uh, until next time, travelers, keep on adventuring. Bye.